Chair, over to you. Hi, good morning, Candice. Thank you. Yes, I'm here and present. Um, and thank you for that. That was really interesting. And um, I hope you slept well after that submission yesterday. Uh, a, good, uh, a good hurdle. Um, I'm going to share some slides um, uh, and then just talk through, uh, talk them through. And then um, uh, there'll be an opportunity to ask questions. And please do ask questions um, um, at the end. Hopefully that's... Uh, it, Matt or Candy, so I can only see you now. Can, are those slides up? Yeah, yeah they are. Thank you. Perfect. Um, okay, so uh, as Candy said, um, my name is Hannah and I'm Director of Development at Street Games. I'm not going to give a history of Street Games, partly for time, but partly I've already seen quite a few familiar faces. So I'm, I'm hoping uh, that you know of us and how we work. But I will touch a little bit about how we operate. Um, and uh, and the, the where we've come from as part of this, because I think it's important about uh, where we're going and what we do. So um, we launched a 10 year strategy this year um, and some of this presentation comes from that. Uh, our mission hasn't changed. I won't leave you to read that. Uh, I'll share these slides afterwards. But essentially Street Games exists to reduce the, the inequality um, between those people who live in our, our least affluent areas and uh, their more affluent peers. And uh, unfortunately, in the last kind of 40 years worth of data, there isn't much change. You are roughly half as likely to be physically active, uh, half as likely to receive coaching, half as likely to volunteer if you're from those less affluent communities. Um, our vision, mission and impact statement hasn't changed in our new strategy. Um, and uh, we absolutely are about uh, the, using the power of sport to transform lives. Uh, and this 10 year strategy has included uh, some key end game statements. So these are what we're working to over the next 10 years. Um, and uh, I won't read them through, but importantly, I think what we're, what we're pulling out here is that it's about every young person having access and the right to access sport and to do that in the way they want, where they want, and the sports they want. So this isn't about picking and selecting, you know, what, what we think is appropriate. This is about full and open equal access um, and that being everybody's responsibility. And if sport is, is getting it right, then we won't see those inequalities exist because there's certainly no evidence of a lack of interest from young people from those low income areas. And how we operate. Um, so uh, Street Games essentially is a, a, a national organisation with about 1400 uh, members, although it's free to join, so that's not quite the right phrase, but 1400 affiliated organisations all over, mainly England and Wales, a little bit in Scotland and Northern Ireland. Um, and everything that happens week in, week out is wholly owned and led by those organisations who work locally. Um, our job is to help them do what they want to do bigger, better and more sustainably. So uh, that's kind of what, what drives us and what keeps us going. Um, and our national partner role. So wh why we're here, we are a system partner uh, with Sport England. And that's the, the phrase that's being used in this, in this round of uh, work um, that they're doing. Um, and we're a national partner with Sport Wales. And with both organisations, we've had a long term funded relationship. So uh, with Sport Wales, we've been uh, funded since 2010, Sport England about the same. And uh, in both places, it's in order to provide that voice, that connection to community groups and that expert eye and ear in terms of our understanding of what's happening in low income communities and how they're responding and also how we can work with them to achieve more. Um, that sector voice is, is very much part of why community groups join us, because if you're a small community group, it's quite hard to have your voice heard and uh, it's quite hard to feel connected at times. So one of the jobs we do and our annual um, network survey is just back in and repeating what, we, what we're pleased to hear is that the first and most important thing we provide for our locally trusted organisations is an opportunity to meet, network and hear from other community organisations. And uh, along with yourselves, the Active Partnerships and many partners that, that you work with, uh, we, are, we work with other national organisations to keep that voice of community groups uh, part of the, the really important development conversation. So I've just given a couple of examples there. 
of groups that we work with. And so then what we know and what, we, what we're learning. So uh, this, uh, these stats, uh, I'm afraid, uh, I'm not starting with the cheery stuff here. These stats are drawn from uh, a whole heap of different nationally published research. Um, there's some from there from women in sport, uh, some from national government published research, uh, some from Prince's Trust. So uh, as you can imagine, um, some of these stats are uh, pre-pandemic. Those that are pre-pandemic are not getting any better, um, but some of them are post and it, it's a pretty negative world. Um, and uh, low-income families, low-income uh, young people from those areas where uh, we describe them as underserved communities, so communities which just have less, um, th things are not improving. Um, about 600 youth centres had closed in the 10 years leading up to the pandemic, uh, so we know that's more now, we're waiting for the latest stats. Life expectancy has stopped increasing. It's about an 18 month waiting um, for a CAMS referral for young people. And um, uh, the health uh, strategies that are being written nationally focus very heavily on the concept of individual responsibility. Um, and in fact, lots and lots of evidence, independent research says that poverty is the biggest factor in terms of people's health and well-being. So although individual responsibility is key, if we do not address the inequalities driven uh, through, the, through poverty, then actually um, individual responsibility won't, won't make any real change. And then I suppose the reason I've pulled these out, uh, not just to ruin your Tuesday morning, um, is because uh, intersectionality becomes absolutely key here. So if you are a woman from a low socioeconomic group, uh, if you are a person from uh, a diverse ethnic community, if you are a person uh, with a disability, all of those things put you in what we, we, we use the phrase double jeopardy, because actually the likelihood that you're going to access sport or the likelihood that you're going to have a positive experience of sport gets worse and worse when you add those additional factors in. Um, and just to highlight this slide, um, again, I'll share it. So I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna go through this, but I think it's really useful information for us when we're thinking about the impact of cost on what we're delivering. But I will pull out just here on the uh, left-hand side of your screens, um, this in particular. So low-income households have about, this is, and this is 2019 data. So they only um, redo this survey about every six years or so. so we, we, the, this is not either post-pandemic and it's certainly not um, cost of living crisis proof, but um, the average low-income household has £3.75 per week to spend on sport. So that's a household, that's not an individual. So if you want to send one child to a football club, how much does that cost you? You cannot take any of your children swimming for that, let alone try to go as a family. So when we're thinking about the impact of uh, poverty or just being in a low income. So before you even get to poverty, just being in those uh, bottom uh, 20, 30 or even 40 percent of income brackets for this country, um, the impact of cost and the freedom of money that you have to spend on leisure and on sport is really significantly affected. So when you're planning and when you're designing things, that, that, that's really important. And then the impact of that, not a huge surprise, the impact of that means that the data tells us that uh, young people are less likely to be active and much more likely to be inactive. And that is also borne out in adulthood. And so one of the things we talk about a lot is about how we build the skills and the confidence and the knowledge you need as a young person to be active for the rest of your life. Because actually those, those young people who are getting positive experiences in PE and in clubs and at home, are building a whole heap of skills, which mean that when they move out or when they go through some kind of life change, they've got some resilience there. We talk about sporting capital. They've got that resilience in their participation, which means they might feel confident enough to go and buy a new pair of trainers and try Couch to 5K. This is how we work. Um, so our, our kind of core ways of operating are that we listen, learn and innovate. Uh, that we look to grow the reach and reproduce good practice and we're constantly insight led. So on that basis, what are the key things we've learned? 
The major barriers, um, they are cost, they are about accessibility, they're about something being local. 70% of all young people that attend street games activity attend within a mile of their home. So it needs to be really local, really accessible if they can walk there better. The others, um, all of the others, so the other 30% attend within three miles of their home. So we're talking a bus ride, a couple of bus rides, absolute most. I've mentioned that concept of sporting capital. So how are the activities you're delivering, not just being a positive experience there, but building that confidence, building that ability to be um, active on their own? Are you teaching people how to book a badminton court? Are you teaching them how to walk into a leisure centre and not feel overwhelmed by the, by the staff at the reception desk or confused by the scanny, scanning thing you need to get through the turnstile etc um, and then we do a lot about building sustainability of provision so our strategy says we want young people to be accessed in all kinds of sporting spaces and places but absolutely core to that is that those locally trusted organizations are sustained for the young people of tomorrow that there is not going to come a point where you don't need a really effective community center in every area that is part of a good, uh, well-run community is a self-owned, self-contained, self-governed community centre. So how do we help those become more sustainable in those areas? And then we talk about the five rights and we, what Street Games describes as, as good quality sport is doorstep sport. That isn't something that just Street Games does, that can be any organisation can deliver doorstep sport. And the five rights are there about the right time for those young people. So that right time will be entirely different for each group of people. Um, but I can tell you for the average teenager, it's not nine o'clock on Saturday morning. Um, uh, right place, I've mentioned about locality, but also about safety. So um, that's thinking about uh, where people feel psychologically safe. If you have a bad experience at school in PE, then using the school playing fields is not the right answer. Right price, I, you know, I won't reiterate that further, as cheap as you can make it. Um, right style, casual, welcoming, warm. You don't need certain kits. You don't need to wear a certain thing. You know, you can come as you are and you can drop in and out. Regular for teenagers is about once a fortnight. So what does that mean? How do you generate that sense of positive um, inclusion in that way? And then right people. Um, Everything Street Games does is driven by the idea that those, those people who live and work in those communities already are the right people to drive that activity. So uh, we, can, we do not parachute in. That is, you know, does not create sustainability. It doesn't create engagement. So how do you engage with the right people? And then last one, I suppose that this is part of how we keep up to date, but it's part of how we recommend you keep up to date when you're designing those five rights. So constant consultation, always asking. That's, that's asking week in, week out, but it's also asking the big questions about what people want in the future. We use, a, uh, we use something called Young Advisors. So we promote young people into those positions of responsibility, into decision-making, but we train them, and we incentivize them to be part of that. If we're gonna pay a consultant, why wouldn't you pay a young person? They're valuable, they're experts in what they do. Think about how you're going to engage those people. Um, you can use peer researchers, that's worth considering. It's much more formal, but it's re really effective and could be a starting point. And then uh, uh, our operation is, as I say, entirely led by those locally trusted organisations. And for us, that involves constant consultation with them. They represent on our board. We have a regional hyperlocal structure driven by them. I will pause. And um, uh, yeah, if people have any questions or want any more detail on any of that, please do ask. Thank you very much, Hannah, for such an insightful presentation. Um, gosh, some of those, some of the statements that you mentioned regarding just how we, we are supposed to teach people, you know, teach people how to access leisure centres and facilities. Something I imagine has been overlooked by many. Um, so given that I don't believe we have any questions, Matt, am I right? Not so far, no. But people okay. can post them and then if there are questions that do come to mind, post them and then we will share all of the questions and answers uh, after the session as well. Lovely. Okay, thank you very much, Hannah. Um, next, I would like to introduce Mercy 
Okay, so Mercy, this is this is a lesson in how to engage culturally diverse communities. The first thing I need to do is pronounce your name right. So Mercy, before I introduce you, could you just let me know, how do I pronounce your name, sis? Literally how you spell it, Buamono. Buamono, thank you very much. <laughs> so Mercy Buamono from Community Development Action Hearts, otherwise known as CDA. Mercy is a community development officer on the COVID recovery ethnic diverse project Creed. She is going to speak to us about the team's experience of engaging with diverse communities across her. Over to you, Mercy. Thank you, Candice. And let me just share my screen. Can everybody see the screen? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, thank you, Candice, for that. Um, introduction and thank you um, Heart Sports Partnership for inviting me here. So I'm Mercy Buomono and I'm a Community Development Officer working on the COVID Recovery Ethnic Diverse Project. It is a mouthful so we're just going to call it CRED and it is delivered um, through Community Development Action. So I've been, um, as Candice rightfully said, I've been invited here to give a brief insight into the project and our work and I'll also share some of our experiences and I'll do this via the learning and the challenges and if time allows I will share a case study but um, I will uh, be rushing through some of the slides because as you were said they will be um, shared later on. So brief background to the project it was Hertfordshire's response to the um, disproportionate impact upon the ethnic diverse communities across Hertfordshire and the aim is to address these health inequalities which have been around you know for so long um, COVID I've only just highlighted it and the three objectives were social prescribing and we work um, in collaboration with primary care networks link workers and community navigators to develop but also to facilitate a pathway for these ethnic diverse communities so they can access um, this support because as we all know they don't really access support for various reasons which I might um, touch upon later on. We also worked in uh, partnership with Power to provide advocacy support but I think most importantly for the project it was capacity building and infrastructure support for the um, voluntary led grassroots communities you know like Hannah said to have their voices heard which is important. So it's a countywide project and it's split into East and North Hertz CCG and um, Hertz Valley CCG. That's the team. That's myself. I cover East and North Hertz and my colleagues Naomi and Roshna with Job Share. They uh, cover the west um, side of the county and we are supported by an advisory group that is made up with people across Hertfordshire. Um, I will speak a little bit on this um, slide. So the initial name of the project was actually the COVID Recovery Black Asian Minority Ethnic Project, which in short, we called it the CRB project. Now the term BAME was met with a lot of mixed um, feelings. There's some people that didn't mind the name. I mean, that minded the name rather, but didn't mind moving forward with the name simply because they felt for the first time, a project was specifically dedicated to ethnic diverse communities and to try and tackle those health inequalities that have well been known. Um, so they felt us um, focusing on a name change it's just taking away the valuable time and also there will never be a name that suits everybody you know so we'll forever be arguing that name. So um, but then again there are others that were really offended you know, they found the term very upsetting, resentful, and they felt we as a project that is working for them, we're labeling them. So how are we any different, you know, from um, the other people? So we had um, our appraisal um, in May and after deep consideration and also cross-referencing with both local organizations and nationally, what names are being used? we decided on the COVID Recovery Ethnic Diverse Project, which we will use for the duration of this project. And we as a team feel it's a fairer representation of the communities that we are working with. And with that also, we had to review our objectives. And um, this came about through the results, you know, after a year of meeting these communities, engaging and listening to them, because we are essentially guided by their needs, what you know they need. And capacity building is the most um, frequent um, 
demand or issue that people really want sorted. Communities or groups are worried about tomorrow. Are we going to be here tomorrow? How are we going to sustain ourselves? You know, Hannah was talking about sustainability is very important, you know, that um, capacity for them to develop. And as we know, during the lockdown, the communities are the ones that really came forward. They, you know, with no resources, um, no um, time at all, they put everything together and they looked after their own. And we want to build upon this. And with community building, I mean, capacity building comes community spaces. Hannah also touched on this, how it's important to have community halls. A lot of the groups are struggling, you know, whether it's a community space to host activities for children to go and play physical activity or even to worship. They're struggling a lot with that. And with all of those two things combined is funding. You know, particularly for those small organizations that don't have capacity or resources, a lot of the funders most of the time want them to reinvent new ideas, constantly write beats. They don't have resources, most of them the skills and the time, you know, so they are struggling to be able to apply for funding and be able to support themselves and the other one is the social prescribing we were quite um, concerned when we did a survey at the beginning of the project nobody had ever heard of social prescribing in the community you know they had never seen adverts of it apparently in their um, gp practices and that worried us because as we know in a couple of days it's going to be rolled out across Hertfordshire and if the communities don't know how are they going to access this support so we're going to carry on working with PCNs, link workers, community navigators to promote the service, create awareness, because they need to have a voice in the changes. And as we know, the way health and social care is being um, delivered is changing. And also with the newly formed, I don't know if you've heard of it, so they've formed a new alliance, which is um, mouthful, I think it's VCFSE, which stands for Voluntary Community Faith Social Enterprises, and they're bringing the faith sector, the community and um, stakeholders, so everybody can be present at the table when we are discussing um, these things. So this was our initial approach, it's quite straightforward. Um, I won't really um, spend a lot of time on that, but I'll just touch on one or two. I'm um, collating information, that's very important. At the beginning of the project, right before we started in April, 2021, between February and March, we held three webinars where invited stakeholders, service providers and community groups to come forward and be present at the table. And during these sessions, we actually discussed what does health inequalities mean or inequalities in general, because every community's um, description is different. So we wanted to listen to that. And we were also very keen to hear what work has already taken place across Hertfordshire. We didn't want to reinvent the wheel because two years is a drop in the ocean. So we wanted a baseline and that's important. They were involved from the word go. So they guided us. So we knew what we were to expect. And of course, listening to community groups is important. Their voices, it's opportunity for them to have their voices heard understanding and building those relationships. We do know mistrust is a big issue, lack of confidence. So we were trying to rebuild that. And then through that, we made sure we engaged in meaningful engagements, engage to understand, engage to review, evaluate what's working, what hasn't worked, what can we do better? Because we didn't want to make the same mistakes again. And then more importantly on engagement, engage to empower them, you know, so they can also be counted amongst people. And as we know, it's a very slow process. Um, a term that we've had quite a lot is hard to reach. We challenge that. They're actually not hard to reach, but they are definitely um, had to engage with. It's a very slow process. So you must have the patience. And I know um, funders are usually breathing on your back. They need those stats. They need those quantitative numbers. But actually, these are things that we can't measure qualitative. The time spent with these communities, and that is as equally important as the quantitative. So these are some of the lessons, tailored communication. I think that's quite obvious. Every community needs is different. So tailor your communication, assumptions versus reality. Um, communities' priorities are constantly changing, you know, and at the moment, 
like everybody else, it's the rising living costs, you know. So that's why reviewing and evaluating is very important. And we must not assume, you know, that that's what their reality is. So we must engage to identify those concerns. And in the slides that I'll send out later, there's some examples that I'll add on to that. Do the work develop your own relationships. And I know it can be challenging, it can be intimidating, you know, going into an environment you're not familiar with. So if I was a white female and I've been sent to go and engage with a South Asian group, I wouldn't know what to do, you know. But I think um, the qualities, human qualities apply here. Be respectful. <laughs> Be honest, be open minded and you might be surprised how accommodating, you know, they will um, be to you and actually open up. And I think we must um, continue not talking, you know, at them, but talking to them. So these are basic things. Our cultural representation matters. I don't know if you notice, I put this, the pictures of us for a point. All of us come from a you know, an ethnic diverse background. That was very important. It was part of the job description for this project. Because if you see somebody, something that you relate with, or that looks like the mercy, you know, I'm gonna engage slightly a bit better. It's not the key to fully engagement, but at least you're somewhere there. Because they feel you can understand them, you know, you can relate to them. And I'll give you a brief example. Um, towards the beginning of this year, I worked on a project in Watford, which was um, on name increase in confidence on the vaccination program and they targeted African and Caribbean communities and a lot of them felt you know they they made comments as well the report will come at end of July and they said they felt they could share some intimate um, reasons for either not getting vaccinated or being vaccinated because they felt they could relate to me because we had that in common. Managing um, expectations and demands I think that's quite obvious. I'll talk a little bit about co-production. At the moment, it's a buzzword, but I think we must ask ourselves, are we actually practicing co-production? Are we inviting them like we did with the CRAID project from the word go? Or are we inviting them at the end? Oh, here's a strategy. Can you have a look? Or maybe we've done this. Can you do a focus group? No, it has to be from the beginning. And research suggests if people are involved from the beginning, chances are they will be along with you towards the end. So I think that's important. Capacity building, I've talked a lot about that, and we are recommending the asset-based community development framework, which is working with people and communities, you know, using their strengths, their skills, their resources, because they have put a lot of time and effort in working for their communities. So we need to be thinking about legacy planning. Don't just go to a community to extract information. How are you going to leave them better? What are you doing for them for empowerment, you know, and because it's as otherwise it feels like it's take, 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 take. We have to take and give. Social media, we found, can be both an asset and also, as we know, problem, problematic. But I think it's important that we um, be innovative in our communication and engagement. I think the traditional ways work with some communities, but in most it doesn't work. Get into those WhatsApp groups. And I do know it's quite hard to get into those WhatsApp groups, but if one can, it's very important you get that real information and I think just engaging with them go talk to them be a part of them don't do this online stuff well at the moment we have to on the phone but go to the communities attend those events be informal chat to them I think that's worked for us anyway challenges mistrust lack of confidence I think that's quite obvious the categorization of being termed BAME I give an example of our project name community capacity and resources by capacity and resources here, we mean time. These are people who have lives, they're family um, people, they work, you know, so we have to bear that in mind. Be mindful of people's lives beyond the groups. They are doing it voluntary, they're other things. And oftentimes you find they request information at very short notice. You can't do that, they can't turn it around. So work with them, find out a way that um, works, hence why it's very slow engagement. And it takes time, you know, and the engagement has to be empathetic. 
you know, it has to be consistent. You can't just give them information and then you come back a week later. No, you, you constantly repeat to yourself, but that's just the way it works. And then um, Hannah mentioned intersectionalities. We are finding that quite a lot as well with the project, you know, complex complexities. There's just so many levels of things people are dealing with. So what you might want is not a priority to them, you know, so you have to find a way of balancing as I said, between demand and information overload. As you can imagine, it's overwhelming. All of a sudden, ethnic diverse communities are spotlight, it's very topical. You know, every, somebody wants a survey, they come to Craig, it's the same communities we're gonna go to. They want a focus group, it's the same communities we're gonna go to. So we need to make um, the information perhaps maybe streamlined, very quick, first, short, they understand, and of course, in different languages. And um, the other thing I will, talk about is the East and West divide. Um, when we started, I cover East and North Hutts, the division in services provision is just so um, noticeable. You know, in the West, it seems there are not more services, but there's a lot of engagement with the communities. You know, in East and North Hutts, it's slow. So the, base, the, the baseline to start off with was more advanced in West than in East and North Hutts. So I've struggled to really engage with the communities and it takes time, two years, is not enough time. We spent a whole nine months almost last year trying to rebuild those trust and relationships. So when you are engaging with the communities, please bear that in mind that you just need a bit longer in East and Northwest in comparison um, to West. And then that's just the engagement tools we use, by monthly newsletter, a lot of you have signed up to that, it's been received very positively. We attend both formal and informal community events, social media, we work in cooperation with our partnerships where we report back our findings. We do quarterly um, feedback reports. And then that's just a case study. Um, so my colleague Roshna is also the chair of an organization called HOWA, which is Hertfordshire Asian Women Association. And they were awarded some funding from Hertfordshire Sports Partnership for um, Thai kickboxing. As you can see there, the impact it's uh, providing the communities. So um, it's important that these communities are given the voice, the opportunities, the funding, the capacity building, all of that, because it is important that once we leave, because at the moment the project is only two years, that they can sustain themselves. And thank you to organisations and many others like Hertfordshire Sports Partnership, they can um, sustain themselves. And that's just contact details. You will get that later. So I just wanted to end um, with a quote that I think summarises um, the work that we are trying to do and others are trying to do as well. And it's support by the late Desmond Tutu and his says, there comes a point where we need to stop just pulling people out of the river. We need to go upstream and find out why they are falling in. So we need to ask those questions. Why do um, um, determinants, I mean, the social determinants of health exist? You know, so we need to ask those foundation questions, why are we where we are? And hopefully that can give us answers, but I do know it's something that it's gonna take all of us, you know, the ethnic diverse communities and the non-ethnic diverse communities to try and resolve this. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Mercy, for such a phenomenal presentation. And I just wanna say, I think you definitely had the gloves up at the end there with your kickboxing. Um, Case, case study. I think you touched on so many solutions. Um, I'm wondering if we do have any questions in the chat. We had a comment um, from one of our guests saying that they could fully appreciate um, some of what you're mentioning because they could relate to that. And we also um, had a comment from our next guest speaker who also mentioned that term, you know, hard to reach, let's ban it. You know, I absolutely agree with you. Absolutely agree with you. That was a phenomenal presentation, Mercy. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions, um, Matt, in the chat from any of our guests today? No, lots of feedback, but no questions. Beautiful, thank you very much. So next, I would like to introduce Shruti Sujani from England and Wales Cricket Board, otherwise known as the ECB. Shruti is the Engagement Lead, Equality, Diversity and Inclusion. She is going to speak about a programme she led nationally across seven UK cities that focused on engaging with the South Asian female community 
as well as some further learning on her national role as the EDI lead for the ECB. Futi, welcome. Over to you. Thank you so much. I am going to hope that I've got no technical difficulties on this work, so let's give it a go. Um, I'm hoping you can all see my presentation. Absolutely, yes. Amazing. Well, first and foremost, thank you so much for your time. I'm really excited to present a couple of slides and share a few of the learnings that we've had here in Cricket to engage South the South Asia female workforce that we have been engaged across the past four years. So when we, in 2019, for those of you who remember, yep, those days before COVID um, feel like a lifetime ago, um, we set out, the England and Wales Cricket Board set out to challenge the norm. Um, in 2019, it was the big issue of cricket. Um, it was the World Cup where we had the England men's uh, pick up the trophy and become world champions. We also had the brilliant Ashes series. And for those who follow cricket, that phenomenal um, innings by Ben Stokes. In that year, something also special happened at recreational cricket. We set out to challenge the norm and we set out to change what data was saying, what insight was saying, and what everyone else was saying. And um, there's a lot of um, stereotypes, there's lots, lots of assumptions out there that South Asian women were least likely to volunteer. Um, South Asian women had lack of role models, in particular in cricket. There was a lack of facilities available where women fit, felt safe, as well as cultural expectations and a lack of opportunities where women felt or saw that they could get involved themselves in roles of volunteering in sport. But as we like to do things differently here at Cricket, we set out to change that and we set out to change the world a little bit uh, and making it that little bit better for women like me. Um, so before I kick off and share our journey, I've just got a, a short video to play to which kind of summarizes some of the impact we've had in the past three years. So hoping the sound works and I really hope you enjoy it. hope you enjoy that as much as fun I've had being a part of it as well as creating it as well as loving the music um but what I love about this short video is it throws the first light out of water and it makes it invalid because in this video you see South Asian women uh participating leading cricket sessions but you also see the next generation those children taking part in cricket and that's what people need to see because when you take your sports or your um, offering of activity to new audiences, there is such a warmth, welcoming and engaging connection. So don't be afraid to try things differently. Don't be afraid to, I guess, break the norm because we did that in this project and that's what really led us to our success. So you ask, how do we get here? Um, and how have we achieved some of the great results um, that we've done? Um, we, had a, we had a bit of a framework which underpinned um, our whole project. Uh, these five pillars were the foundation of delivering Dream Big Desi Women. This foundation has also been, this framework, sorry, has also been the foundation of the England and Wales Cricket Board's volunteer strategy. So especially if you're trying to engage a new workforce, and this could be as a paid workforce or even on the ground delivering your activity or sport. Over the next couple of slides, I'll take you through each one of what we've done differently and hopefully some tangible takeaways that you can take away and hopefully implement in your um, in your centres or your activities or your offerings to really engage um, a new audience. So when we talk about Inspire, um, in 2019, when we set out, we had nothing. We had no imagery of South Asian women. We had no imagery of children who looked like from the South Asian background. And we spent a year on building that. So as the previous speaker, Mercy said that two years, it, you're still building that relationship. You're still building that connection. 
don't um, underestimate the time it does take to build them connections. Um, so we spent the whole year of actually listening to the community and listening to what they wanted, not what we wanted, not what the England and Wales Cricket Board wanted to deliver, but what they wanted from cricket. And this has also uh, bled into some of the community groups that I've set up nationally now. Um, we are, we, we're really playing that listening part. So the women, this identity, this brand Dream Big has been created by the women for like them for themselves. So we're really excited that we were able to launch Dream Big. It was a little sad because when we did launch Dream Big, it was a week before COVID. So we had to do, we had to pivot and navigate a lot of changes throughout the COVID years. But when we talk about identity, we talk about the connection. So people like to be a part of something. And if you if you go on Instagram, you go on Facebook, you go on any social channel, people like to follow things. So if you're able to connect a connection or identity to your offering, um, it really allows individuals to feel a part of a bigger movement and a bigger community. Um, and one of the, the lucky things we had, because it was a national project delivered across seven key cities, we were able to link it to the national brand of England and Wales uh, Cricket Board, as well as All Stars and Dynamos, which are our entry programmes for children to get involved. Um, but then we gave the local flexibility. So what works in Leicester didn't work in Nottingham, for example. So each city had to flex the approach, had to be agile, had to be super flexible to what the, their audiences were saying to ensure that what we were trying to do is engage the female workforce um, actually resonated and was relevant. We also use the tools on like Instagram and Facebook to connect with this audience. So we create, we've created a closed Facebook group. So currently we've got around 400 women on the closed Facebook group who share what they're up to. They share their personal stories. Throughout COVID, we saw a lot of them talk about mental health. And for those who are aware in, in South Asian community, talking about mental health is, is still seen as a taboo. So we really use the power of social media and the free tools that were available to really create that close-knit network. We also individually create our Instagram profiles because we know people like to connect with authentic stories. So we've we've all created our own individual Instagram accounts where we share our stories, we share our lifestyles and really connect with that community. So connection is key um, and try use your brand um, no matter how many times you see it a day for a volunteer or for a participant, it really has huge value. So definitely take time on that inspire pillar because it's all about getting people excited to get involved um, with what you're offering. When we talk about recruit, so just wanted to give a quick update. So once you've got people excited and inspired through your brand, through your offerings, through whatever it may be, it's all about making sure they convert into actually going out and delivering or participating in your offering. So to date, since 2019, we've currently recruited 1,760 South Asian females who've committed to delivering either All Stars or Dynamos, who've volunteered. And some of the women have gone on to great things. And one, one of the most, I guess, insight or stat that I'm really proud about is 11 of these women have secured full-time jobs within cricket. So that's already changing the face of what cricket looks like. And it's been amazing to see women who never had anything to do with cricket, but really engaged and actually got full-time jobs and got paid for um, doing something they love. So really excited. And we anticipate that over the next couple of months, we will actually reach our 2000 ambition is what we committed to and what we set out. So watch this space and hopefully you'll hear more as well. Um, one thing I definitely, as I mentioned in throughout is around being flexible. Uh, we took some time around really understanding the audience that we were engaging, and this really allowed us to pivot our approach and know when things weren't working. So when we talk about South Asian within England and Wales Cricket Board, we talk about India and Pakistan, Sri Lanka and Bangladesh and Afghanistan, individuals from Afghanistan. What we realized that predominantly the base that we were engaging were from Pakistan and in Indian, um, I guess, backgrounds. So we knew we had to do more to connect with them um with them communities and I think to the, to a point around when you use umbrella terms you you kind of put people in boxes or groups and you kind of forget people so really understand the data the insight you're gathering and how you can pivot for different groups different ethnic groups or different protected characteristics because there's so much that happens especially around intersectionality um, we knew that word of mouth was so powerful, so we really worked on incentivizing people to bring friends or using their own social channels to feel a part of the brand. But we also gave the ECB brand Dream Big to 
to the women to allow them to post on WhatsApp social. So they really felt about the community. And then we also knew that a lot of the women um, were working, over 50% of the workforce were working. So we really flexed our training times to fit around their work and their family commitments. So again, by gathering insight and data, you're really able to like pivot your approaches. And I think being agile and flexible is super key, um, especially if you're trying to go down attracting new audiences to your offerings. Also, one of the key ones that I just want to pull out here is 94% um, of that workforce that I mentioned um, had no coaching qualifications or any affiliation to cricket. So these were all new women that we were engaging in cricket. And I think the key thing that stands out is the offering that we had because it was made for women like them. So again, can't um, put enough value on actually gathering insight and data. And you can do this with surveys, you can do this with conversation, um, but do it in a way that's meaningful to your audience. Um, and I just wanted to draw out, so we also captured like motivations for why they took part and one of the key ones, um, I won't read because you, you'll be able to read off the slide yourselves, but one of the key ones that I wanted to put out is when think about yourself whenever you are you do a new activity. So think if whether it's joining the gym or whether it's um, joining a new club or even um, doing various social activities. One of the key reasons people will never put out why they've done something is to make new friends. But one of the outputs that a lot of women that went through this program got was actually making new friends. So what we then did is we we pivoted our key messaging around friendships because they're the friendships that you never know that you needed basically became through the program. So can't emphasize enough being agile, being flexible and really using your data to inform the decisions you make. Um, but it's all underpinned by trust and building great connections within the community. Um, just some tangible, so we've, we've spoken about Inspire, we've spoken about uh, Recruit and just going on to Train. So this is the third pillar of the framework. And when we talk about Train, just some of the key, key little changes that I guess are often forgotten about. Don't underestimate the value of women only sessions. Um, again, super value, super important. And when you do do women only session uh, sessions, also ensure the coach or the instructor is also a female because that's a that's a mistake we often see happen. So again, just making sure we create that safe space. Um, we provided um, that extra support for online training or any training that we needed to provide. So we opened out to individuals to come more than once to the same training. Um, it wasn't a case you've done the training that we think you're there. We offered it multiple times to the to the women because we knew that they wanted to grow their confidence. So again, allowing people to attend more than once to the same course if they're learning something. Um, as I mentioned, word of mouth or bringing their children. So whenever we did any training sessions on the side, we provide like a mini crash, which was run by like an activator or volunteer. Um, it just makes it that little bit easier of what's happening in their lifestyle to accommodate for. We were also the first national governing body to introduce modest apparel kits. So every volunteer had the access to have um, looser jogging bottoms, head scarf, looser, lo looser and longer t-shirts, as well as sleeves to ensure that we were appropriate catering for, I guess, their, their needs um, from a body image perspective, but also culturally. And then, as I've mentioned already, really flexible on time of training. I really love this photo on the left, and it's because it shows that we didn't mind what you wore, what you looked like, however you turned up, there was a place for you in our training session. So the lady over here was in Asari and I absolutely love that because it shows that we're breaking, like you don't need to wear your skin tight leggings or a t-shirt. Um, you, can, you can be who you want, wear what you want, just bring your whole self and have fun in our cricket sessions. And that really resonated with the community that we were engaging. Um, when you and then going on to the fourth pillar, just around retain and celebrate, um, it's important that you continue to keep the dialogue open um, and not kind of speak to these individuals when it's right for you or because there was a need for you to actually get them through your door. Um, we looked at extra things that cricket could offer and appreciate that it might be slightly different in your position, but have a look at what you could offer um, extra for people attending your session. Don't just think about the sole activity or offering that you've got. Think about extra add-ons that they could offer and they could take up. So we did things around mental first aid, which as I mentioned, came in really use throughout COVID. 
Um, loads of women have started their foundation level one coaching. So again, our coaching workforce is transforming. Uh, we get provided a lot of mentoring and I know Hannah's on the call from Street Games. So we work with Street Games to provide mentoring opportunities for a number of women across um, up north. Um, we also provided a number of work experience opportunities so people could actually see what a day in the life is working for the ECB or working for your local county board. So think outside the box, be creative and think more than just what's in there in the moment that you've got available. Um, and saying thank you, it goes a long way. So take the time, whether it's a handwritten note, whether it's an experience that they may not have, um, or whether it's just bringing the women together for a coffee morning. Um, we often forget the little things. So we've really focused on having like a coffee morning or bringing the women together, um, as you can see in 2019 around the Cricket World Cup, or even just writing a handwritten note from Claire Connor, who's now the interim CEO for the England of Wales Cricket Board. So the little things, saying thank you goes a long way. Um, and then that leaves for me to say thank you to all of you for listening to my um, presentation. So I hope it provides some a few tangible takeaways. If you do want to hear any more about Dream Big, uh, you can just type in on Google Dream Big Bessie Women. Uh, you can join our Facebook group. It's a female only group as well. So it's Dream Big Bessie Women on Facebook. Um, and you can keep up to the latest of like my journey on Instagram or on LinkedIn. Um, and also some of the wider work that I'm doing in the EDI space for the ECB. So thank you so much. And I'm more than happy to have any conversations or chats if it helps as well. So back to you. Thank you. Truly, thank you for such a powerful presentation. I wish we had plenty more time. I myself will definitely be looking into your programs and projects. Um, and I love the video and I absolutely love the music at the beginning as well. So thank you very much. Um, Matt, I know we are um, slightly behind time. So, and I know we had a couple of questions in the chat. Um, are, we, are we able to answer them or shall we move on? Yeah, I think we can probably quick. So um, first question was, was there a particular age group um, that you found really took part in terms of the Facebook or a particular age group that didn't take part in the Facebook group? Um, so we on um, Facebook, we found that it was like your 30 plus profiles that were were engaging and the elder generation, like the parents or um, yeah, the parents of individuals were more on Facebook and more engaged, more connected. And then on Instagram was more of that younger audience under 30 that were engaging and um, participating in our posts and conversation. Great. And then with regards to the childcare, was that formal or kind of recreational and kind of probably maybe something is this, how did you consider like the safety aspect of things? Yeah. So all the volunteers that take part in the programme are DBS checked. So we ensured that obviously the volunteers that were running the cricket activity on the side, they were all DBS checked. So just make, so the volunteers that opted for were DBS check, they had all the training, they delivered national programs and they had first aid qualifications. Um, and what was also good was we kept the parents in sight as well um, to the ratios that were required. So it was just delivering mini sessions of All Stars or Dynamos. Brilliant. And in terms of the, um, the Amplify part of your volunteer management, was that kind of wasn't, uh, is how did you go about that? Yeah, so for us, we kind of split that into three key, um, I guess, headings. Uh, one was around, is it helping us raise the profile of the project? So Dream Big as a whole. Is it helping us recruit more individuals? Or is it helping raise the profile of ECB? And whichever three it fell under, we did that. So um, if you do Google, and this is definitely not me blowing my own trumpet, but if you do Google Dream Big, Bessie Women, you'll see a few media appearances that have been fortunate um, been able to do um, at Lord's Cricket Ground, um, as well as um, on the World Cup final. So we we really took all the opportunities we got and even opportunities like today, this is, this is helping us raise the profile of um, volunteering. So I think it's connecting in and looking at the purpose of if you do a certain action, how is it going to help you? Brilliant, thanks. Thank you so much, Ruti. You're allowed to blow your own trumpet. Absolutely, <laughs> yes. For the phenomenal work that you've done. So thank you once again. So our final sharing session is going to take a slightly different approach. I would like to introduce um, back to you, Matt Ridley, um, the Sport Development Officer, not that Matt Ridley, 
the Sport Development Officer for Broxbourne Borough Council, who has kindly offered to lead the next session with Mikkel Saraniak, the Engagement Manager for CBS Broxbourne and East Hart. Matt and Mikkel have been working closely together on a number of projects involving culturally diverse communities across Broxbourne. And in addition, Mikkel has a vast amount of experience engaging Eastern European residents elsewhere in Hertfordshire. Matt is going to lead a conversation with Mikkel exploring some of the approaches, challenges and lessons learnt in their work so far. Matt and Mikkel, it is over to you. Thank you, Candice. <laughs> Thank you, Candice. Good morning, everyone. Hope everyone's doing good and enjoying the webinar so far. Um, while Mikhail sets up his slides, I just wanted to reintroduce myself, really. My name is uh, Matt Ridley. I'm the Sport Development Officer for Boxbourne Borough Council. And I feel super privileged, actually, to introduce Mikhail, who is a fantastic ambassador for our diverse community in Boxbourne. I'm super excited for you all to get to know him and the fantastic work he does for the community. We have prepared a lovely short interview for you uh, to give you a brief, brief background into the work he has done, uh, how he has done it, what changes he's made and the impact he's had in our community. community sorry. If that sounds good to you. I would like to uh, get the audience to get a feeling of what Matt Mikkel is about and who he is. So Mikkel, over to you. Thank you, Matt, and good morning. I'm trying to find uh, a way to present this. Okay, great. Right. Can you hear me okay, everyone? Time up? Lovely. First of all, I just want to say a massive thank you for, for an invitation. Secondly, a huge congratulations to uh, previous speakers as well. Each presentation has been absolutely phenomenal and, and super informative. Uh, some of the stuff that I'm going to be talking about uh, will probably be a little bit repetitive. Hopefully, I'm hoping as well, that will give you some sort of uh, ideas uh, in terms of how to engage so-called uh, candies, hard to touch groups, uh, but again, I, I like to call them easy to ignore. Right, Matt. So, so just, just give uh, the audience uh, a feeling of who you are, Mikhail, and give a background to your organizations you represent in, in Boxbourne. Super, yes, I'll be very brief, and you, you, I'm also pleased to say that I've only a couple of slides, because I know that we will be going uh, shortly to uh, breakout rooms as well. So I, I work for, for the CVS for Broxbourne's Hearts, we are based in, in East Hartford, in Stansted Abbots. Um, the, the charity was, as you can see, originally established in the 1970s. We currently employ 40 people, so we, we are you know, quite a big organization. And we also work you know, uh, approximately 50 volunteers. We also are at least holding for six community centers um, you know, across, across the county. We host and support a number of projects, uh, building better opportunities, job smart. I'm really pleased to say my colleague Sarah Forbes is also on this call. We run community car scheme and a number of other things. More recently, and this is, uh, uh, you know, at the moment, my main role within the CVS, we also have a locally trusted organization for a number of big local projects. So um, again, I don't know if you are aware, uh, Big Lottery Fund decided to invest 220 million pounds. It's a lot of money in 150 areas of highest deprivation and as, as a CVS we now support six areas, one of them in Hertfordshire and five of them in London. As a charity, as you can imagine, we have a, you know, a, a board and, a, and staff expertise in a number of uh, areas, community development, finance, human resources, volunteer management and many others. We also have a quite, a, quite a little experience in governance, uh, in, in developing and writing constitutions, in terms of references also, you know, uh, helping groups to um, to write funding applications. In relation to our conversation today, I think that's really, really important uh, in terms of sport and, and engaging with, with BME communities. Um, over the years, we, we also, uh, in my different capacities, we've worked uh, uh, with a number of agencies uh, um, and, and sport projects to engage with so-called hard rich groups, as I said, you know, or easy to ignore them. And we work with a number of uh, agencies, um, Hartford Sport Partnership, Beef Living, which is a local housing station, Broxbourne Council, Active Broxbourne, Active Hearts, East Hearts, Lee Valley Regional Park Authority, Street Games uh, as well. And, and also we've worked uh, at the European level with, for example, Croatian National Olympic Committee and also local authorities from Austria and Portugal. Yeah, very brief and concise. 
<laughs> you've just mentioned all those partnerships. I'm really keen to hear about all the success stories you've had of these partnerships, mm -hmm. Mikhail. Can you share that with the audience, please? Yes, of course. Again, this this probably is one of my favorite slides. So, uh, you know, again, as you can see, slides from a number of different projects, sport projects that we've uh, we've run over the years. Um, at the top uh, left uh, top corner, uh, again, absolutely phenomenal project with, with our local Livali Regional Park Authority. And again, I could talk for Britain about it. I'll be, I'll, I'll try to be very brief. Um, we've we've worked with Livali Regional Park Authority, obviously as a as, as a local kind of you know a, a facility, um, a, a fantastic venue, uh, which again. Uh, is quite accessible to a number of different people, but again, not necessarily accessible to, or was not accessible to BME communities. And um, I, I spoke with, uh, with, with um, uh, the uh, development officer, and we've tried to come up with a project which engages BME communities. And it's absolutely essential as well to kind of to highlight that the, the, the facility itself is located in one of the most deprived areas in Hertfordshire. Uh, in Woven Cross as well. And man, many members of the DME communities who live in that area have never actually had a chance to visit the site as well. So we've run a number of projects at Livali Regional Park Authority, including projects such as uh, introduction kayaking or canoeing, but also we've worked uh, with, uh, with many other you know, groups and, and communities. In my previous role as a development manager for Warming Term for Big Local, I've also worked with a local health work um, and the health work uh, participants had a chance as well to experience a bit of rafting and canoeing at, at, the, uh, uh, at the venue. Absolutely wonderful project and it was amazing to see people kayaking, canoeing, have never been in the water before. Absolutely phenomenal. This, uh, the image in, in, in the middle as well um, is an image of, of a project which again, an uh, a national, uh, sorry, a European initiative which I really, really like called the Move Week. So again, I've worked with Matt, you know, a lot on this as well in the past as well. So the Move Week is a, is a European campaign which promotes sport and physical activity. And I've, I've, we've run a number of events, uh, you know, uh, across, across Brogzlin's house, but also across other areas um, in, in Hertfordshire. And this lady was running our uh, Nordic uh, walking session. So as you can see, two things I would highlight here. So number one, identifying key partners, key venues and facilities, which can help you to enhance your sport and health message. But also, I was really always very keen to, to ensure that I can tap into other uh, initiatives which are happening at the local, national or, or international level. So this photo at the bottom, um, at the left left uh, hand corner, is a photo of a, of a tournament that took place ages ago. It's 10 years ago since this, this event took place. I'm not sure if you remember, I'm a big, big football fan. And um, so in 2012, Poland and Ukraine hosted European Championship. So I've also wanted to organize a replica tournament, and this event took place in Hoddesdon. It wasn't only about playing football, it was more about, again, helping men, particularly men, it's really important to emphasize men uh, from, um, from different BME communities to, en to engage. And apart from you know, playing football, we also had uh, uh, you know, teams from, for example, representing police or fire, fire, fire services or, or local housing station. Bad news, two Italian teams play in the final and the Polish team came third. Uh, other than that, it was a fantastic, fantastic day. Uh, more recently as well, just to give you a flavor of, of, of some of the things that we've been doing as well, uh, we've run also, we've tried to kind of tap into some COVID funding as well and to enhance and kind of strengthen our health and sport message, but also something which hasn't really been brought up yet, it, we've worked with uh, local uh, businesses as well. So, for example, this uh, this boy sitting on this uh, lovely, lovely, uh, quite quite fancy, you know, smoothie bike. This event, a health event, which took place only, um, you know, in March of this year, um, was hosted by a local Polish restaurant in Hatfield. So that's with, with, with kind of my non-CVS hat on as well. So we've been trying to do different things and really to kind of engage with people and promote this kind of sport and, and health message. Really absolutely amazing. Absolutely amazing. Okay. So thank you, Mikhail, for sharing that with, with the audience. Um, it's a true testament to the wonderful job you do here in the borough. Um, how did you go about engaging uh, with those people who have never really engaged with uh, community centres? Right. So again, some, some of this stuff has been already said before, so I'll try to be really brief and, and, and again, uh, hopefully it won't be too repetitive. I think the key, there are a number of key things. It's not in no, no particular order. 
building relationships with key individuals within the particular community. So for example, it might be someone who's really interested in, in volleyball, trying to make a connection with this person, trying to kind of uh, utilize uh, uh, those kind of skills within different communities. It might be someone who plays cricket, someone else who, uh, who plays volleyball. I've, I've noticed there's uh, someone uh, from the English uh, you know, Handball Association. I fell in love with, with handball when I was studying in Croatia. Creating opportunities for dialogue, that's so, so important. Maris mentioned this as well, you know, building trust, is absolutely essential in, in ensuring that any of this can happen. So creating opportunities for dialogue and building you know, sustainable relationships with, with people. And, and again, identifying a need with, with the communities. That also means working with other agencies locally. It might be the council, it might be local housing station, it might be someone else as well. So really, really important. Um, again, as I said, you know, working with a number of uh, agencies in the area, investing in training and learning opportunities. What does it mean? And again, this something is this is not something that has been mentioned before. So it's not only so. For example, this volleyball guy who is a good friend of mine. His name is Krzysztof. So he's very well known to the uh, Hot Future Sport Partnership. So he's now trained at the level three, you know, volleyball coaching, and he's absolutely, you know, uh, loves sport very much. But again, also other than than investing in sport, also what I would encourage us to think about more broadly is to also recognize there are a number of networks in Hatfordshire in different areas and different districts of the county and. And, you know, Asian Association was mentioned before as well, to really help people to understand how to tap into funding. So, for example, investing in training and helping people to write funding applications. So, so some of that work can continue and, and, and can, can develop further as well. That is really, really important. So at the moment, you know, I write, you know, also outside of my kind of working life, you know, most of the funding applications, for example, for the Polish community in, in Well and Hatfield, but I'm really keen to ensure that other people also skilled up, if you like, so that the that work can continue and 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 can develop further as well um again you know very often i think we're trying to reinvest sorry not re reinvent the wheel there are already a number of existing networks and contacts you know uh, uh, across Hertfordshire. in in well and hatfield we have polish satellite school in uh Brogsbon, we have ukrainian stations again it's an uh, it's an it's a it's a community group which I'm, I'm working quite a lot with at the moment you know so there are a number of established community groups with really good reputation and it really is quite important to kind of to, to work with them. So as an example, if you want to engage with children and, and families, Polish Saturday School in, in, in Wellington City has 120 children attending that school every Saturday. So straight away, you have really, really quite quite a, a big group of, of residents. If you want to do any consultation or an engagement work, you know, this is this is this is definitely a place to go. And Mercy, as an example, had a chance to attend one of our health events, which took place, um, um, you know, we were on tour, one of them uh, in, in November of last year. Often we've talked about it quite a lot, and I really, really love the subject. You know, um, don't let's let's stop making assumptions, or, or we, let's challenge stereotypes as well. You know, and again, you know, it comes down to building this trust as well, and trying really to be as open and honest as possible. When we engage with people only because doesn't speak, you know, or has English as a second language. It doesn't necessarily mean that he or she is going to be difficult to engage with as well. So. I don't like, as, as Candice and you know, a number of other people said, I don't like calling these groups, you know, BME groups. I include myself in this group as well, because I'm originally from Poland, uh, hard to reach, but they're simply you know, often easy to ignore. And we often, you know, and particularly now when the public purse is so stretched and there's so much less funding possibly available, we need to find creative and new, uh, new ways of kind of working together as well. So there's definitely a lot that you've already said. Hopefully I've kind of, you know, added a few bits and pieces. So hopefully this, this will give you, uh, you know, a food for thought as well. You touched base on, on funding uh, earlier, yes. Mikhail. If someone, if someone wanted to do a similar project, uh, did you resource that yourself or did you apply to other funding grants uh, locally or nationally? Right. So it's good to know, guys. It's my last slide. Uh, it's, it's, you know, uh, it's really, really, you know, uh, it's it time, time flies. So basically, again, just give, I'll, I'll give you a flag of what we did uh, in the past. So I've mentioned Lee Valley. Uh, again, I, I wonder how many people on this call uh, are aware that uh, Lee Valley Regional Park Authority has community access fund. Um, again, this funding is available to local groups and communities. And, and I've utilized this you know, many times in the past. Absolutely amazing. And, and again, 
uh, each project which I mentioned before, particularly with uh, with White Water Center, was funded through you know Committee Access Fund. And um, second example, uh, Beefy Living, they funded a number of projects in in Borough Broxbourne as well, uh, sport related, but also not all sport related. And again, it's a really fantastic orga organization. Um, street Games, uh, not recently, uh, you know, probably five, six, seven years ago as well, if they funded a, a few things, including a Christmas sport event, which I've run in Wellington City. More recently, Hatuch Community Foundation um, again funded a number of COVID-related projects. Um, again, and this this uh, has been completed literally at the end of March. Really successful. We've been able to engage uh, with really a, num a large number of, of uh, individuals on, from the Polish community. And this is also in, in, interesting. There's hot from the press. Charlie Mann, who's also on the call, who works for Hot uh, uh, Sport Partnership. Again, um, uh, we, we, we met and we managed to get a Sport England funding, again, mainly for the Polish community. And this project will start in September as well. So uh, one other thing, which again, you know, I don't know if people are aware, um, Hartford County Council, uh, apart from you know, having their own internal uh, pots of funding, each county council, and we have 78 county councils in Hartford, they each, you know, now, each county council has a um, uh, committee, um, it's called locality budget scheme, and each one of them has 10,000 pounds to spend on committee-based initiatives. And again, that's something which is an easy application, quite a, quite a simple thing to do as well. And we, if we help our groups and communities, and if we build their confidence, also with, with things like bid writing, I'm absolutely convinced that some of this work, you know, uh, can be developed further as well, and, and not only maintained, and, and, and some of this project will be retained, but also I think will be strengthened in the future as well. So there are a number of pots, you know, uh, available. Um, and again, particularly, I think, in terms of engaging BME groups, I think there's definitely a lot of funding available at the local national level as well. Thank you for, for listening to this Rockon presentation, guys. That's it, I'm done. Thank you, Mikhail, for taking my questions. Just wondering if anyone else had any questions for Mikhail. Don't think so, Matt. Thanks for your time, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much to Matt and Mikhail. I'm blown away by the presentations this morning. And I know that we've won over time because we've all just been totally engaged. There's plenty of um, comments in the chat for you, Mikhail. And um, I think from a Stevenage Bar perspective, I think we'll definitely be getting in contact with you and all of the presenters today. So um, I know we were due to move out into breakout rooms. Um, hopefully, I'm not sure how much time we've got in those breakout rooms, but I'll hand over to you, Matt, because I know there's been a slight change in the programme schedule. Thank you. Um, thank you all. Um, sorry those breakouts were, were so short. The Jamboard, so that link is going to be live, as I said, for the rest of the week. Um, so please do um, give your thoughts on there, throw different ideas, especially, you know, to our Hertfordshire contingents. Uh, you know, especially on that gaps and the next steps that we can do. Um, as said at the start, please send us an email at HSP if there are specific, even within this area that you would like um, to hear more about or a specific topic area as we develop these learn and share events. Um, I just want to kind of finish with a couple of little bits. There will be a link uh, for your specific feedback. So please complete that and let us know your thoughts. Um, there are a load of sessions that are coming up for our learn and share events over the kind of next few months. Um, and that, for some reason, it's not letting me share my screen. Um, so these are our um, next sessions. Um, so our next session is in July, um, hosted by my colleague, um, Adrian, and that's on uh, climate change. We've then got healthy lifestyles and body image. Um, I'm very excited for the 20th of July um, to listen to Kate Dale and Lisa Wainwright, so please do join us for that one, that's going to be absolutely fascinating. And then we've got Staying Active Before and During Pregnancy, and our evening with Frank Dick, OBE, hasn't opened yet, but bookings will open. So we will share that um, across, uh, across the network in the coming weeks, um, so please do join us. So my final thing is thank you so much to Candice for hosting. Absolutely brilliant job. Uh, thank you to Hannah, Sharuti, Mercy, Matt and Miguel. Um, thank you to everyone for joining us, especially from our Active Partnerships Network. It's great to see some familiar faces. Um, and to our Hertfordshire uh, organisations, thank you for all the work that you do. 